Wow, what a lucky day, huh? And a three-day weekend? You guys want to come in on Monday? We could all just kind of feel like we're all together on Monday? No? What's that? Pizza and beer. I'd come in for that. Pizza and beer. <laughs> Do I get any extra credit? No. Uh, no, I, I, I kind of doubt I'll be here too. If you want to come in, you can. you can. I tell you what, if you come in here on Monday, all right, assign yourself some extra credit. How's that? <laughs> I give myself four extra points for this, you know? I mean, it's kind of good to pat yourself on the back. Okay, well, enough of that silliness. Let's dive into biochemistry because the sooner we dive into it, the sooner we can get done with it, right? That's a good thing. Um, we finished talking about the citric acid cycle. We finished talking about the glyoxylate cycle. And I hope you can see the relations between the two. They're very, very similar cycles. But those two enzymes of the glyoxylate cycle make it a very different um, uh, set of considerations than we have with the citric acid cycle. Moving our attention now to a structural thing. It's sort of an odd uh, turn to take. We're not talking metabolism in the lecture today and probably even a little bit into the lecture on Monday. But the reason we stop and make this sort of uh, side turn is it's important to understand membranes because we're getting ready to talk about electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation. And these processes, uh, first of all, occur in membranes. And second of all, they require membrane integrity. At least oxidative phosphorylation does. And so it's important that we understand what is in a membrane. So that's why we're, we're doing this little side thing. Membranes, as I'm sure you learn in any basic biology class, are comprised of what we call a lipid bilayer. And this schematically shows you that lipid bilayer. Uh, we can imagine this being a cell, of course, is not to proportion, because this would be the membrane around the cell, and this would be the inner uh, portion of that cell in white, which we would think of as the cytoplasm. The uh, organization of materials in that membrane are such that there are molecules that have a dual nature about them that comprise that membrane. Okay? The dual nature is that they are what we refer to as amphiphilic. Last term of the very first lecture, we talked about what amphiphilic meant. And amphiphilic means it sort of has tr characteristics of being hydrophobic and being hydrophilic. Well, in the case of these compounds that we see in the lipid bilayer, we see, first of all, that uh, they have what we describe as polar heads, okay? And we'll see a little bit of the structure of these in just a little bit. This polar head is uh, water-soluble. It is hydrophilic. They also have long nonpolar tails. These are typically the side chains of fatty acids, although there are some exceptions to that. But they're typically the side chains of fatty acids, and these are very nonpolar. These nonpolar things associate with each other, the polar components associate with the water in which the cell finds itself. So there's the outer portion of the cell. There's the inner portion of the cell. And of course, both of those are water-containing uh, substances. All right. Well, I said that the hydrophobic portion of the membrane is um, comprised mostly of fatty acids. And so it's important we spend a little bit of time talking about fatty acids. On the screen, you see two fatty acids. They're probably the two most abundant fatty acids we find in our cells. Palmitate, uh, which is the ionized form of palmitic acid. People always ask me, what's the difference between acetate and acetic acid? I use the terms interchangeably. But technically, acetate has lost a proton. Palmitate has lost a proton. If we call it palmitic acid, technically it means the proton is on. I don't make that distinction, but that's the difference between them. Oleate is, of course, the ionized form of oleic acid. And you can see that there is um, a chemical difference between these two. And more importantly, you can see there's a structural difference between the two. Because palmitic acid is what we describe as a saturated fatty acid, all of its bonds can rotate. And since they, are tend, they tend to be hydrophobic in nature, they will extend themselves out as far as they can to make it a fairly linear uh, substance, like so. Okay. Um, the oleate, on the other hand, has uh, a single double bond. And that single double bond makes it become an unsaturated fatty acid. 
So when we hear that term, that's what that means. This is a monounsaturated fatty acid because oleate, oleate only has a single double bond. But that single double bond changes the shape of this fatty acid. You can see there's actually a bend in it, unlike what we saw above. And this bend that we have in the fatty acid uh, is resulting from the fact that the double bond in there has a cis configuration. The vast majority of cells that we, I'm sorry, the vast majority of fatty acids we find in the membrane of our cells um, have bonds in the cis configuration. When we talk about trans fats, I'll talk about them later, but they, trans fats generally arise from the fact that your food has been chemically treated. Okay? Trans fats are not made in any significant abundance in um, most biological systems. There are a few exceptions to that, but for the most part, trans fatty acids do not occur naturally. Okay. Well, uh, when we look at a fatty acid, we can see that uh, there are uh, various ways we could describe it. We have uh, a carboxyl end, we have uh, a, uh, a methyl end, and these bring uh, up, there's actually two different ways that we can refer to fatty acids. And the first one you see on the screen is called the omega numbering system. Okay. The omega numbering system would start numbering, if we put numbers on there, actually, it's not showing the omega, I'm sure it's showing the delta, even though it has omega data out here. Uh, the delta numbering system starts with carbon, the carboxyl carbon being number one and moving with greater numbers towards the methyl group. If we were to do the omega numbering system, it would be the other way around. We would start with this one being number one and count that way. Well, why do I mention that? Well, I'm sure most of us have heard about omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3 fatty acids um, arise from the fact they have a double bond three carbons away from that methyl carbon. So the numbering orientation that we use is important. Most designations of fatty acids are actually not according to the omega numbering system, but are in fact according to the delta numbering system, which is actually the numbering that you see on the screen. I said that wrong in, uh, the first time. Okay. Now, this shows an omega-3. So after they've just shown you a numbering the opposite way, here's the omega system. One, two, three, and there's a double bond. Omega-3 fatty acids are, in fact, uh, associated with some positive health benefits. We'll talk about those later. One of the benefits um, of omega-3 fatty acids in a person's diet are, is associated with having lowered, level, uh, I can't say it, lowered levels of LDLs, which are what people refer to as the bad cholesterol, and higher levels of HDLs, which are what people refer to as the good cholesterol. Okay. Well, there's a list memorized for the first exam. And, uh, okay, you guys know my jokes by now. All right. So uh, it's a list of fatty acids. And uh, I just show it to you to show you there's quite a variety uh, in terms of fatty acids. Uh, the most common, sh uh, we, we don't typically see fatty acids uh, as such, much shorter than about 12 uh, carbons in length. And we don't see them uh, much bigger in size than about 22, 24, maybe 26 in length. Okay? Now, I'm not going to ask you to memorize the, uh, any of the, the, the configurations here. I think you should know, uh, and we'll talk about this later when we talk about the metabolism, you should know that, that palmitate is a saturated fatty acid. And later I will ask you to know uh, some unsaturated fatty acids from today's lecture, all I'm going to ask you to know is the fact that oleic acid is an unsaturated fatty acid. Okay? Now, that bend that arises in the um, fatty acids that are unsaturated as a result of that double bond causes uh, some interesting structures uh, to arise. Here is linolenate, which is a uh, one, two, three double bonded uh, fatty acid. It is, in fact, something we refer to as an essential fatty acid. Okay? So essential fatty acids are fatty acids that have double bonds beyond position delta 9. I'll explain what that means in a second. But from the delta numbering system, we would say, OK, we're doing delta numbering. We're going to start over here with carboxyl 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay. If they have double bonds out beyond this point, you can see this guy has 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay. We can see that it's got, it's got double bonds out here beyond where position 9 is. 
Now, why do we say that they're essential if they have double bonds beyond position 9? The reason we say that is in animals, of which we are that category, uh, that category, we cannot make in our bodies double bonds beyond this position. This is the last one that we can make a double bond with. If we try to make these, we can't do it. We don't have the enzymes to make that. So because they're essential, that means they must be in our diets. Question? Notation-wise, do we use upper or lowercase Greek delta? Uh, the triangle. Yeah. Okay. Which I guess is uppercase. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, let's look at how these things play into some of those molecules that we have in the lipid membrane. Remember I was talking about fatty acids there. I haven't described the molecules that are in the membrane. So in terms of uh, amphiphilic molecules in the membrane, there are two big categories that we find in the membrane of cells. Two big categories of uh, molecules in the membrane. One category is schematically shown on the screen, and it's a category I refer to as the glycerophospholipids. Glycerophospholipids. You commonly hear people refer to phosphoglycerides, and this would also describe these. I tend to like the word phosphoglycerolipid because I think it better describes it. What does the name mean? Well, phospho means it's got a phosphate. Look at that phosphate. Glycero means it's got a glycerol molecule in it. There's the glycerol. Okay. And lipid means it's got a nonpolar component. There's the fatty acids with the, with the nonpolar tails. Schematically, this guy looks like the following. This portion of the molecule on the right is very polar. That's that polar head that I talked about in the, glycero, in the uh, lipid membrane. These two tails hanging off are very nonpolar, and they're the nonpolar non portion of that uh, amphiphilic molecule. Okay. Here's another example, and this one is unfortunately twisted around a little bit, but you can, I think you get the idea. This is a common molecule that we'll talk a lot about. It's used in the metabolism of making the general uh, glycerophospholipids, and it's also used in the making of fat. And this guy is called phosphatidate, or as we'll probably more commonly call it, phosphatidic acid. That's what I usually refer to it as, phosphatidic acid. And we can see that it, too, is a glycerophospholipid. There's the phospho part. There are, is the glycerol part. And there is the lipid part out here. In fact, this guy is identical to what you saw in the last uh, slide, except for the, in the last slide, the phosphate was attached to something else. In this case, it's not attached to anything. But cells make this molecule in the process of making those other ones that I showed you. Okay. Now, when we take and we attach something to that phosphate, we create something we call a phosphatide. A phosphatide. Okay, there's yet another name for the same class of molecules. A phosphatide is a general name. It's not a specific name. For molecules that are glycerophospholipids that have something attached to the phosphate. Phosphatidic acid okay, would not by itself be a phosphatide. But if that phosphate were attached to any of these molecules that you see on the screen, we would have a phosphatide. Well, that's actually done to simplify the naming a little bit. All right? So if we think of the phosphatidic acid as being the phosphatidyl part, we've used one word to describe that whole molecule. It's phosphatidyl. Then we attach something to it. If we attach an ethanolamine to that phosphate, we have phosphatidyl ethanolamine. If we attach an inositol to it, we have phosphatidyl inositol. If we attach Kevin Ahern to it, we have phosphatidyl Kevin Ahern. Okay? You start to get the idea. All right. So there's a lot of different things that can be attached to that phosphate. As you might imagine, they can give that uh, molecule some different properties depending upon their chemistry. We won't really go much into that here. But um, this is what these guys look like once we've made those attachments. Here's phosphatidylserine. There's the phosphatidyl part over here on the left. And the red part includes, in every case, the attachment. <coughs> Excuse me. 
This guy down here uh, is a little unusual in that it's two phosphatidyls that are linked by a, a middle uh, a glycerol. Okay? This one is, is a lipid that we commonly find in the membranes of heart cells. It's called phosphatidyl, uh, diphosphatidyl glycerol. It's also called cardiolipin. Okay? Um, this guy up here, uh, we talked about last term, you might recall, phosphatidylinositol. Where did we talk about phosphatidylinositol? Remember? A derivative of phosphatidylinositol? It had a name of IP3. Pip? Pip? Yep. And what was that? What was in that, that involved in? That was in the pathway. It was in the signaling, right? So this was involved in the signaling pathway that we had near the end of the term last uh, term. And so, um, not surprisingly, when we drew that, we showed that that was found in the membrane. And of course, all of these compounds are found abundantly in membranes. They make up the lipid bilayer. All right, so I told you that one category of molecules in the membrane are the glycerophospholipids. The second major category of lipids that we find, of, of uh, lipids that we find in the membrane are known as the sphingolipids. Okay? Now, at first glance, they look somewhat different in overall structure compared to the glycerophospholipids, but in fact, they, they're not as different as they would otherwise seem. Here is an unusual sphingolipid shown on the bottom. It's unusual in that it contains phosphate. This is one thing most sphingolipids do not contain phosphate. All right? But there's a phosphate right there in this guy. This guy, sphingomyelin, is very, very important molecule. It's found very commonly in the membranes of nerve cells. You've heard of the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath is extraordinarily abundant in sphingomyelin. The sphingolipids in general tend to be more abundant in nerve tissue and consequently are more abundant in brain than they are in other tissues of the body. Some of these sphingolipids, <coughs> I'm sorry, some of these sphingolipids that we find in the brain uh, are actually quite complicated. Here is a schematic representation of a simple one. It has the sphingo part, which I'll come back and show you schematically in a second, attached to either a glucose or a galactose. And we didn't see that with the glycerol phospholipids. We did not see attachment there to any of the sugars. Here's a difference. The sphingolipids are usually linked to a sugar, at least one. Okay? This guy is a cerebricide. Again, a cerebricide is a category of molecules. There's a whole set of classes of these. And cerebricide is distinct from a gangliocide in that a gangliocide has all of this general structure over here, but instead of having a simple sugar on the side, it has a complex oligosaccharide out there. So remember how the blood groups had those complex oligosaccharides out on the cell surface? This guy has a complex oligosaccharide, which oligosaccharide meaning it has several sugars, and they're commonly very, very intricate in uh, their structure. Yes, sir? Are those associated in any way with degenerative neural plaques, such as in Alzheimer's? Are these guys associated in any way with degenerative neural plaques in Alzheimer's? I'm not aware that they are, no. But I will tell you that one of the things that happens with um, uh, multiple scler uh, uh, sclerosis is that there is uh, the myelin sheath, for example, can be attacked by your own immune system, an autoimmune reaction that can happen. So that's one place where sphingolipids can play uh, an important role in, in uh, health of neural tissue. And we'll see other examples um, in a little bit of places where enzymes that break down sphingomyelins when, or sphingolipids when they are deficient in the body, they can lead to very severe neurological defects. So yes, but I'm not aware of anything with respect to uh, Alzheimer's, no. Okay. Um, oh, I thought I had a schematic. I guess I don't have the schematic. All right, well, we'll leave it be. That's not a big deal. That's one less structure for you guys to recognize. You. You'll have to take it on my, on my word that the sphingolipids structurally are very similar to those of the um, glycerophospholipids. Okay. Well, let's talk about some, <coughs> some more molecules that are found uh, in membranes. And here's a very common component of membranes. You'll notice it's not very amphiphilic. It mostly resides in the nonpolar portion of the lipid bilayer. The only portion of this molecule that has any polarity at all is this OH that's on the end. Right? 
Cholesterol. Now, cholesterol, I've talked to a couple of you in class about already. Cholesterol is a really, really interesting compound. We're going to talk more about its metabolism later. We're also going to talk about its movement in the body later. And uh, I'll be honest with you, it's one of the bigger mysteries of biochemistry, despite the fact that it's been studied intensely for over 100 years. There have been something like five Nobel Prizes that have been given for the study of cholesterol. And there's still a lot of things about cholesterol that we don't know. What we do know is that cholesterol is an important component of membranes. An important component of membranes. And it probably contributes to, at certain temperature ranges, increasing the fluidity of membranes, which is important. It doesn't change the temperature, but it certainly widens the range over which a membrane is fluid when it's embedded in it. Now, uh, as I said, cholesterol is found inside of the uh, nonpolar portion of the uh, lipid bilayer, and we'll talk more about that in just a bit. All right, so what I've given you so far are the big... Oh, I one, one more thing I want to say about cholesterol. Cholesterol <coughs> is... Uh, interesting, and again, when we look at the brain, the brain really is a different kind of environment than what we see in the rest of the body. Cholesterol is extraordinarily abundant in the brain. If you take brain tissue and you dry it down, okay, that is, remove the water, 14% of the dry mass of cholesterol, uh, of the brain, is cholesterol. Your brain is full of cholesterol. So you have to have cholesterol. Okay? You have to have cholesterol. We think, oh, cholesterol, bad, right? Well, your body's making cholesterol for a reason. Too much cholesterol, bad, all right? But we have to have uh, some cholesterol for our membranes. All right, I love this picture. It looks like some, a professor I once had. You know, that mouth is out there. <laughs> maybe I look like that sometime. I don't know, maybe Monday morning, that's the way I look up here. Uh, but this depicts uh, an interesting... Um, um, environment. I believe this picture was actually taken at Yellowstone. And um, there are organisms that live on virtually every niche they can live in on the face of the earth. And the environments in which they find, in which cells typically find themselves uh, in their native environment um, can be very, very, in some cases, chemically nasty. Okay? Well, this is one of those chemically nasty uh, places and when we think about places where there's nasty chemistry, as it were, we have to start thinking, well, how do cells protect themselves? How do they avoid being consumed in reactions or being damaged by the, the um, uh, conditions in which they find themselves? And one of the ways in which we find that is uh, by modification of the lipids that are found in the membranes of these cells. Okay? Now, that class of, there's a class of comp <laughs> compounds called the archaeans. That was the, the, the word that was on the last slide. And the archaeans live in very odd environments. They can live in, in salt water that's amazingly salty. They can live in those hot conditions here. They can live in very, very acidic conditions. They can tolerate things that a lot of other cells can't tolerate. Well, it turns out that um, the bonds that we have of... Um, the, uh, between the fatty acids or the other compounds that are in uh, glycerol phospholipids are susceptible to acid breakdown. Or acid breakdown. So if they're growing in an acidic environment, they could be losing their membranes if the, if the pH is too low. Well, if some of these cells have modifications to the uh, glycerol phospholipids that they have. And you're probably going to look at it and say, well, what is the difference here? The difference is that in the regular glycerol phospholipids, this bond right here is an ester bond. That is, there's normally a double bonded oxygen coming off of here, and there's a double bonded oxygen going off of right there. Okay? In the case of the um, archaeans, they make what are called ether linkages. This is an ether linkage, COC, with nothing else that's there. And these ether linkages that are in these, these um, glycerol phospholipids of these archaeans tend to be more stable and allow them to uh, be successful in those environments. And there's other modifications that we see in some things as well. Okay. Now, this picture is nice because it does schematically remind us of the fact that the glycerol phospholipids, there's a, a phosphoglyceride, same thing, 
uh, resemble very much the sphingolipids. They're single myelin. Look at that. We've got a long polar tail. We've got long, or actually two long polar tails. We have two long polar tails here. We have a polar head group. And so overall, they don't appear that different from each other. Here's an Archean lipid, and although it's slightly bulkier, slightly different, different here, the overall structure really isn't that different. And so it tells us, again, structure and function are related. When we see conservation of structure between different organisms, we know that that structure must be very important for uh, some purpose. Okay, and there's a shorthand depiction. There's the head, polar head, there's the nonpolar tails. Okay. Um, we've all, we all, all have heard of micelles. We know what micelles are. And micelles arise as a result of having amphiphilic molecules. These are fairly simple amphiphilic molecules. And the most common example of these would be something like fatty acids, in which we have a COOH at one end, which is negatively charged, and then a tail sticking out like here. Okay? Well, if we only have a single tail, these guys arrange themselves in a nice tight little sphere Okay, that doesn't form a lipid bilayer. Right? It just forms what we call a micelle, and that's the, the, the structure that you see on the screen. So it tells us that that second tail is important, and when we look at that second tail, what we see is the addition of the second tail prevents micelle formation. So instead of bending around and making a sphere like we saw on the uh, last example where we had a single tail, the two tails instead will arrange spontaneously into a lipid bilayer. So again, structure and function are important. We have that extra tail on there. It can't make a micelle. It makes these sorts of things. And these sorts of things are important because they make up our membranes. If they can form naturally in aqueous environments, then it's very, very easy to make membranes. And as we shall see, it's very easy to artificially make membranes. <coughs> Okay, blah, blah, blah. Ooh, I like that, okay. Memorize that structure, right? <coughs> well, the artificial structure, <coughs> excuse me, that I was referring to um, is called a liposome, L-I-P-O-S-O-M-E. Why would I wanna make a liposome? Well, let's imagine that, uh, first of all, I wanna make one, so how would I make a liposome? Let's say I take uh, a bunch of glycerol phospholipids that I have isolated. I take, I take a bunch of sphingolipids that I've isolated, and I put them in an aqueous uh, environment, in, let's say, in, in a beaker. So I dissolve them in some water. I shake it up. Maybe I sonicate it or something and get everybody moving around. When everybody gets moving around, what will happen is the membrane will spontaneously form. And so the membrane will arrange itself in a bilayer just like a cell. That is, we'll have an outer portion here where we have the polar thing sticking outwards. On the inner portion, we will have the polar thing sticking inwards. The nonpolar tails will arrange in this green region. But the important thing here is we've basically encapsulated something inside of this lipid bilayer, just like a cell does. We've made it artificially. We've mixed these things in a beaker, and this spontaneously forms something like a cell. Well, why do, we want, why do we care about that? It turns out that we can do some cool things with that. All right? So here's my mixture. Here's my glycerol phospholipids, okay, sphingolipids. And now let's say that I have a drug that I want to use to treat cells with. Moving drugs across cell membranes is murder. You can create the greatest drug in the world, and if you're curious, come by and I'll tell you some really depressing stories. You can create the greatest drug in the world that will specifically target and kill specific cells if only you can effectively get it across the membrane. Okay? So there are strategies that people have introduced for getting difficult to move molecules across membranes, and one of them involves making liposo liposomes. All right? It's easy to make a liposome. Here's my drug. This drug is in red. I take, I sonicate, I shake this up, I do whatever. And what's going to happen is I'm going to form liposomes as a result of that agitation that I've just given. Some of these liposomes will have, of course, depending upon the concentration of my drug, are going to have encapsulated in them drug. Well, so what? I want to get it into a cell. I don't want to get it into a liposome. Well, it turns out 
that because this membrane is essentially the, has the same chemical structure as the uh, uh, compounds in the membranes of your cells, you can mix them with the membranes of your cells and they will actually fuse with each other. And when they fuse with each other, guess what's happening? The drug is being kicked into the cell. So this is a mechanical way of introducing drugs or other compounds into cells that don't normally want to go there. It's useful as a laboratory tool. It's probably not the most useful thing in your body because you're not necessarily wanting to fuse every cell in your body with things that you're going to put into it. Okay? But as a laboratory tool, it's a wonderful way of delivering things across the membrane of a cell. Okay, I'll slow down for a second. Questions? Yeah? So her question is, does the fusing require certain proteins? Uh, because otherwise, if it didn't, all of our membranes would just fuse. Yeah, you're, you're correct. Not all of our membranes will automatically just fuse. And I'm, I'm simplifying this considerably. You'll notice when I made the liposome, for example, I had to use some agitation. And that is an important component in helping that fusion happen. But, but you're exactly right. Um, if, if we didn't have that, then we would just be one great big fused membrane. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Other questions? Okay. Uh, lipid bilayer permeability. Okay. One of the reasons that cells have a lipid bilayer is it's really great at keeping things you don't want out of cells. The lipid bilayer is fairly impermeable to most substances, and there are some exceptions to that. The biggest exception that you see on the screen is on the top right, and that's water. Water, surprisingly, moves across the lipid bilayer quite freely. Quite freely. Okay? That actually poses a logistical problem for cells that I'll talk about in a bit. But it moves quite freely. Glucose, on the other hand, which is something that you say, hey, cells want glucose, they need energy. Glucose doesn't move very well across that lipid bilayer. Okay? So does that mean that cells are starving to death most of the time? No. It means that cells have to have a way of getting it in besides simply letting it move across the membrane. If they sit and wait for this guy to move across the membrane, the cell's going to starve to death. So the membrane is very good at keeping out things that we don't want. It's unfortunately also very good at keeping out things that we do want. But cells aren't stupid. Cells have evolved mechanisms over the years of integrating inside of them things that they need and they want. And the mechanisms that they have evolved involve proteins that are specific for specific molecules. Last term when we talked about insulin signaling, we talked about the gluts. Hey, remember the gluts? Glucose transporter proteins. What was the function of the gluts? The function was to bring glucose in. These are membrane proteins that are specific for letting glucose in. So we're going to spend some time talking about proteins that bring specific molecules in. OK. Um, small ions, sodium, potassium, boy, they don't get across there by themselves very well at all. And we'll see they play some very important roles, however, in cell chemistry. Well, I'm at the point of talking about membrane proteins. Um, that one really doesn't tell us anything, does it? This schematic uh, diagram shows us something the, uh, of the, about the different nature of proteins that are found in a lipid bilayer. Right? The membranes of cells... <coughs> contain a considerable amount of protein, as she noted up here. They contain a considerable amount of protein. The amount of protein varies from one cell type to another cell type and from one membrane type to another membrane type. For example, if we look at the membranes of the mitochondrion, okay, they have something like 90% of their mass as protein. They're really abundant in protein. Other if we look at this in the plasma membrane of the same cell, it won't have anywhere near that amount of protein. Okay? 
So we have some designations that we give uh, as names to these different classes of proteins. And I will tell you that different books give them different names. So we're going to use my names for here for, for one, one time, okay? My names, I have specific names uh, for these proteins. A protein that goes through both layers of the lipid bilayer is called an integral membrane protein. So A and B are integral membrane proteins. A protein that goes partly into one of the layers of the membrane okay, is called uh, a peripheral membrane protein. I couldn't pull it out there. A peripheral membrane protein. So C is an example of a peripheral membrane protein. Other proteins aren't, don't even really interact with the lipid bilayer, but they may interact with something else, like D is interacting with B here. We call D proteins associated. That is, if we were to look at a membrane, we would see some D there, but it's not really interacting with the membrane itself. It's associated with something that's in the membrane. D is called an associated pro membrane protein. The last category of proteins, or what you see over here, is E. And you'll look at E and you see this little spring-like tail hanging off. What that is is a fatty acid that is covalently linked to E, and that fatty acid has buried itself in this nonpolar region. This guy is what I refer to as anchored. We can see a little anchor hanging off of E to help hold it in the membrane protein, in, in, the, in the lipid bilayer, I'm sorry. All right, so we have A is integral, B is integral, C is peripheral, D is associated, and E is anchored. All right. Now, I want to tell you about a cool protein. And I want to show you this cool protein. And when we talk about electron transport, I think it's next week, I'm going to show you guys how to make a photosynthetic fish. OK? I'll show you how to make a photosynthetic fish. It actually involves this protein. Right? This protein is called bacteriorhodopsin. And bacteriorhodopsin is shown schematically. You can see that it is a protein that is an integral membrane protein. And this integral membrane protein has a very cool function. It's got a little molecule of vitamin A on the inside of it. And that molecule of vitamin A plays a very important role when, when light hits it. When light hits the vitamin A that's inside of this bacteria rhodopsin, the vitamin A molecule changes its configuration. Vitamin A, of course, is involved in our vision. And the reason that we see things is because that vitamin A is changing its configuration in our eyes. This is happening in a bacterium. It's changing its configuration in the presence of light. The configuration change involves a change of a cis bond to a trans bond. It's a very simple kind of a mechanism. Now, I want to plant that idea in your head as an interesting integral membrane protein. And then if you want to remind me, if I forget, when I talk about electron transport, we'll have a photosynthetic fish, OK? OK, cool integral membrane protein. Another interesting protein, we talked about it last term, is porin. Porin was a, molecule, was a protein that we described as having its insides out. Because we said that most, last term we talked about protein structure, we said that most proteins that are dissolved in the cytoplasm, in fact, virtually all proteins that are involved, uh, dissolved in the cytoplasm, have an arrangement of amino acids such that the nonpolars are where on the protein? On the inside. And the pores are on the outside. However, when we get to a, lip, so a protein that lives most of its existence in a lipid bilayer, we frequently see that's inverted. This was an example of one that was inverted. It had its nonpolar proteins, uh, nonpolar amino acids on the outside, associating with these nonpolar tails. And on the inside, there was water moving through it. So we saw the hydrophilics on the inside. So again, structure, function, relationships sort of make sense once we know the chemistry of the um, cell. This is uh, a, an enzyme that is a good example of a peripheral. Okay? You can see it's going through one portion of the lipid bilayer. 
And this enzyme, whose name is very long, which I'm not even going to go through here, is, uh, is given a simpler name of prostaglandin synthase. And for the moment, I'm, I don't care that you even know that. I'm just showing you some interesting proteins here. I will talk about this protein later because it catalyzes a very important uh, reaction in the synthesis of compounds called prostaglandins. And uh, these compounds are involved in pain, swelling, and other uh, problems. And this particular enzyme is interesting because it makes these prostaglandins and it's inhibited by aspirin. It's inhibited by ibuprofen. So the reason that we describe these things as painkillers is they're stopping this enzyme from making molecules that make us feel pain. So, cool example of a peripheral membrane protein. There's aspirin. Memorize that structure. Ha ha. Okay. So, we're moving rapidly along. Questions before I dive into one more topic here? Everybody exhausted? You want a song to maybe perk things up a bit? <coughs> you got to sing loud because I'm not, I don't know how well I'm going to do this. And this is a long song, too. Okay. This, this song, actually, is the only song I sing in class that was not written by me. It was written by one of my students a few years ago. So I will encourage you to develop your own songs, bring them to me, and if they're good, I'll, I'll steal them from you. Uh, that's what I did with this one. Actually, she knew I stole it, but it's, it's very cool. So this one is called Citrate Sonata. It's about the citric acid cycle, which we've just finished, and so I thought we'd go through it. It's to the tune of God Rest Ye Married Gentlemen. Our fats and carbs get broken down to acetyl-CoA. Oxaloacetate combines in cycles TCA. The product of reaction 1-O-Citrate is its name. Isocitrate, the product that ensues. Atoms got moved. Isocitrate is the product of step 2. And oxidation soon occurs, reducing NAD. An alpha keto glutarate resulting from step three. From here we could make glutamate, that is if there's a need. Don't forget that we lost a CO2. Yes, it is true. In reaction three, we lost a CO2. So what's the point of all these steps? Well, let me tell you, friend. We use electron carriers and working towards our end of synthesizing ATP, a metabolic trend. Oxidize and then oxidize some more. Here in step four, keto glutarate gets oxidized some more. The enzymes with cofactors five, including TPP, they lipoate, FAD, CoA, and also NAD. A succinyl that's on CoA is what it's made you see. This reaction occurs so favorably, don't you agree? It's a good reaction energetically. With four more steps, we're halfway there, so let me summarize. When CoA is lost, we see that GTP is synthesized. The succinate that is produced will soon get oxidized. FAD goes to FADH2. What did we do? We made funerate and FADH2. Add water, cross the double bond, and they like we create. With one last NAD, we can then dehydrogenate to give a final product of oxaloacetate. It's removed and this lowers delta G. Oh yes, indeed, it's through pulling that this last step can proceed. So take a breath, you've learned it all, then what is it you say? That's of such great importance that I need to take away. Three NADs have been reduced, each now NADH, GTP, and an FADH2. They were made too. Yes, a GTP and FADH2. We passed electrons, eight in all, we've made two CO2s. Triphosphates like our GTP give energy to you. 
Electron transport is the chain that certainly ensues. But I think this deserves another song. This is too long. And with that, I end our citrate sing along. Isn't that cute? That was cute. Uh, I want to recognize that was written by a former student of mine. Her name is Tari. Uh, actually, she goes by the name Tari, Tari Tan. And Tari is presently in the PhD program in neurosciences at Harvard. So uh, very happy, very, very proud of her also. So very cool. OK. Um, let's see, where was I? Yeah. OK. Let's dive in. We'll spend uh, just a couple minutes getting, yeah, we're not going to stop. Otherwise, we have to rush next time. So let's, get, let's go through and do this. So for the, <coughs> All right, the last thing I told you about had to do with the fact that uh, we saw that there's arrangement of the structure of proteins depending upon the environments in which we found themselves. Porin was inside out. We start thinking about proteins that have to cross that lipid bilayer. It's not, <coughs> excuse me, it's not surprising that we might be able to look at amino acid sequences and say, hey, there's a very nonpolar portion and then there's a turn, there's another nonpolar portion, and there's a turn, there's another nonpolar portion. We might be able to predict, based on amino acid sequence, which proteins are found in membranes. And in fact, we can do this reasonably well. Okay? We can't predict the exact structure, but we can predict whether they're going to be in membranes. There are some rules that people have written and given out, and no, we're not going to worry about the rules. Uh, but you can look at these and see, uh, going from top to bottom, there's various energy values that have been assigned to these. And these have to do with their tendency to, to, to associate with water. High positive values, they don't like to associate with water. Low positive values, they do like to associate with water. And if we start looking at a sequence of proteins, we can say, hey, here's a region of the protein that's got very positive values. Here's a region of the protein that has very negative values. We can start understanding something about the general shape of that protein, the general structure of that protein, and the tendency based on where we see these helices, will this be a membrane protein or not be a membrane protein? Okay, there's quite a few rules. Here's, here's a sort of a schematic representation of such a protein. Here, uh, yeah, that's porn right there, so we'll go back that. All right, all right, you guys are restless. Let's call it a day, and I will see you on Wednesday.